Okay, hello everyone, this is Paul Akers and I'm with wonderful Alex and Jack, two of my favorite people in the whole world and we're in Japan and we just finished another Japan study mission, Team 50. Alex, this is your second time here, right? Fourth? Fourth time. Fourth time on the Japan study mission. And they uh, corralled me together and they said they wanted to ask me some questions spontaneously and they didn't tell me any of the questions. These guys are my best friends, right? They would do that, put me in a quarter like that. So here we go. We're gonna answer some questions. Go ahead. Thank you. And the first question is, you have devoted all your life to helping people. The question is, why, why, why? When somebody helped me and showed interest in helping me develop, what I felt like was amazing and as a result of that, I wanted to have everyone experience what it was like to have someone do that for a human being. And that was Mr. Thomas. You want to know who? Yes. It was Mr. Thomas. He was a military colonel. He lived across the street from me. And I was very young, maybe 13, 14 years old. He always used to, I used to go across the street because he's a very interesting character and he was working in his garage. And he would always impart all this wisdom to me all the time about life and how to conduct myself. And it, it just felt amazing. Yo. And that's why I'm doing, trying to impart wisdom. That was how many years ago? Oh gosh, I was 13 years old. I'm 63. That was, uh, that was uh, 50, almost 50 years ago. Wow, what an impact in something at a very young age mm -hmm. have on you. I'll never forget it. Mr. Thomas, an amazing man. So we can take a different route now. Okay. How do you want to live to 110? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to, to support that? Well, to support that, I make my health my number one thing. I know you can see her. A lot of people say, make your family number one thing, make God number one thing, make this number one thing. For me, it's health. And I learned that here in Japan. And the reason why it's health, if you don't have your health, you don't have your family. You don't have the ability to serve God. You don't have the ability to do anything. So taking care of your health is number one. I learned that from Mr. Takagi. Uh, Takagi, uh, you've been to yeah. Takagi, yeah. right? And he was 90 some years old when I interviewed him and he had a, a saying up on the wall and it said, help is number one. His mother lived to 113 years wow. old. So he has been a total inspiration to me and help is number one. You can't give to anybody if you don't have good health. And if you have good health, you can give a lot more than if you have margin. What, what is the one thing that many people don't get about health? It's simple. It's not complicated. All the YouTube videos and all the books and all the nonsense and all the nutrition and all the micronutrients and all the other stuff. I have this good friend, I'm not gonna say who he is because he's pretty well known, or if I say who he is, everybody would know. But he said, Paul, have you have you seen on the app? It's got all these micronutrients and you gotta track all that stuff. And meanwhile, he's overweight and I'm perfectly fit, right? And I said, but you're overweight. How is that helping you? You know? But anyways, it was, it was crazy. I'm going, you're making it too complicated. And he's a guy who likes to complicate everything. And I'm like, come on, dude. It's very simple. Everything lean is simple. Yeah, it's, it yeah. seems to be. It, not not everything, but it sure seems to be. Can you sum up Japan? Three inspiring words. Simple, quick, short. Order, words. order. Yeah. First of all, just order. When you walk into Japan, when you fly into Japan, you come to the airport, you just feel order. You feel like, you know, you think about how the blood courses through your body in perfect order and systematology, right? I mean, God ordered our body beautifully. We sweat at the right time. Our heart beats more when it needs to. Everything is in order. Japan is in order. 22 years you've been coming to Japan. 23, years. actually. I'm in my 24th year now. 24th yeah. year. Yeah. What would you consider the, the key learning from Japan? To keep learning. Never been. To, to, to keep learning, to, to have this childlike uh, mentality. You know, I don't say this often because some people think that MacArthur was being disparaging, but he looked at the Japanese people when he came here and he said, but your children, you say to do something and they just do it. They all fall in line because they want to learn. They want they want to move forward. And you've been to the Japanese schools and we you saw, saw how we wonderful saw the Japanese children are. They're very engaging, they're curious. lively, they're curious, they're fun. They're like a bunch of children. You, you just be like a child. And you got it. It's beautiful. Okay. It was a beautiful. Changing the subject again. Okay. We all went You're not going to get provocative yeah. on me, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> I know you, Jack. <laughs> well, I like I like the genuine answer, oh, straight sure. to the truth. So we all have problems in our companies, mm -hmm. no matter who we are. We do too, fast cap. What's the biggest problem you face in your company? Well, right now it's getting good people. I mean, I think globally in Japan, they would say the same thing. Of course, their problems are much smaller than your problems and my problems. But yeah, getting good people because the work ethic has changed. People want to be on their phone, be on Facebook, and they don't want to work. And, that, and it's very difficult yeah, dealing with that issue. 
Okay. That's my biggest one right now. I think maybe before you might have said that's an excuse. I didn't say we can't do it and we have to be more creative and we have to do a better job of training and developing the people that we currently have because if we lose them, then we're really at a deficit, yeah. right? So that would be the approach I would take. Well, we certainly need to have maybe a few more creative ways to find people. I think we need to be even more, 10 times more creative in how we keep, retain, and develop. That would be my charge to myself as well as other people. And in that note, I know that we've discussed this before, that you really put attention on hiring process. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is the one key that you're looking yeah. for so you're not wasting time developing people that really are not up to the task? And boy, it's no fun when you do that, isn't it? terrible when you bring someone on a trip and they don't get it we've we spent all, all this time and money we've all done it so the number one thing is to hire for character and teach for skill and so what that means is very simply is when you interview a person when you talk to a person do they have contempt for humanity or do they have love for humanity and I think, you know, we talked about someone earlier today, right? And we won't say the name, but there was a bit of contempt, a bit of ego, a bit of, you know, that person's really not that good and they make fun of them or something like that. Any, and remember Mr. Amazawa, what are Mr. Amazawa's conditions for termination? If you look down on the Gamba people, or if you lie, or if you manipulate the numbers. So let's just start with the first one, Mr. Amazawa. If you look down on the Gamba people, if you have contempt for humanity or other people, don't come around me. Uh, we've noticed that many people are trying to implement two second lean and they're not really successful, but it seems that they haven't really read your book because one of the points is doing the rest. Uh, so we even up everyone the humble way. There's so many dojo experiences in the restroom. Can you tell us more about that? What really represents because many executives don't understand what the restroom is about. Yeah, well, it's really the ability for man to humble themselves. I mean, the bathroom is for for the lower class society to clean. It's not for the executive or the leader. And so in Japan, they actually have a culture where executives are required to adopt a public restroom for a period of time, a month or two or three months, and they go there regularly to clean and take care of that public restroom. Because if you can't be humble, it's really difficult for to be successful in life. It, you know, you're gonna knock yourself down with, it, with your ego. Well, who's going to build your dream house again? Oh, what a great question. Now I'm really liking this what question. Like? Well, first of all, so people know you can go online, look at my house. I have literally the most beautiful home in the world, palatial, 15 acres, everything perfectly manicured, you know, probably a total of, embarrassed to say four or 5,000 square feet. And if I did it all again, I would have none of it none of it. I would have a single one bedroom or a studio home, the smallest one with the most amazing kitchen, the most amazing bathroom and a beautiful, comfortable living room and a place for me to work. And that's it. Okay. Nothing more. What about the garden? How small. It needed me to spend at least 10 minutes a day in it. It required me to blow the leaves just big enough that I had to spend 10 minutes because I think being out in nature and interacting with all that is critical. So a super small house in a super small yard, beautiful, elegant, lots of glass, tons of sunlight drenching you inside. Japanese stuff? Yeah, Japanese stuff. Absolutely. Concrete floors, everything simple, easy to clean, no carpets, no multiple different kinds of surfaces, but everything so that if I needed to clean the house or tidy it up because someone's coming over, 10 minutes, the house will look beautiful. Yeah. And if you pitch that now, what car do you see on the drive? Well, what I enjoy the very most is a motorcycle, a mm. little scooter, a 150 scooter or something like that. But if I had a car, because I have to rent cars in some of the places that I am, I like just a small little Toyota, you know, hatchback. I can put my kite gear in there, two seats, simple, economical, easy to take care of, nothing fancy. I don't need a four wheel drive and a big, great big monster thing to look cool and anything. None of it matters to me. You know what looks cool? Being kite surfing on the water at 63 years old and oh, kicking yeah. ass. Very good. That looks freaking cool. Not what car I drive. Perfect transition, Paul, okay. because my next question is, many do not believe that lean can be applied in different areas. Mm -hmm. 
and I have seen how you applied lean in kite surfing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how you have applied that in kite surfing? Because I've seen the whole journey and you're rock and rolling today. And I'd love for you to just show all uh, the different improvements yeah. you've done to get where you're at. Well, the number one thing that how you apply lead in kite surfing is humility. It kicks the crap out of you. And so you could be an accomplished person. Here I am, a pilot, an author, and everything. And the minute I get out in that water, I look like a little schoolboy. I mean, I can't do anything. It's so difficult. So the key in applying lean in this environment is to be humble and just, you know, I, I have a new instructor here that's teaching me, that's teaching me foiling. And he goes, hey, he always addressed me, hey, rock star, you know, and why he does that is because I'm out there getting the crap kicked out of me. Falling off the board, he goes, I can't believe you're not dead after that, right? And I get right back up. Okay, what's next? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So the key here is having that humble attitude and just wanting to learn. And this is so much about what we yeah. is about so that's one and then always looking for ways to improve I'll give you a great example of that I want to ramble on and on I like answers to be short but my kite instructor told me that when you pull it on the bar that you're actually collapsing the kite and that the bar tension is about this far of a throw and you basically want to work in this realm right here and when you pull in more than that you're collapsing the kite you're like suffocating the kite and so i was always putting the bar down here and so i said you know you know what uh, andreas wouldn't it be cool if that bar had painted red it was red from here to here and then oh, maybe black from here to here management. so visual management so the soon as you saw yourself enter into the red zone actually the red zone would be down here and the green zone would be up here you're in the green zone you're good anywhere between here and here here and here not good right and he looked at me and goes that's a freaking great idea they should do it like that's that. how you do lean you always look at how to make things better in this case visual management well not only should they do it i'm painting my bar as soon as they get back to the dr i'm painting my bar with that people go what is that it goes that's my visual management knowing i'm not pointing in the bar too much yeah that could innovate into a product it, well i've already got a kite serving product i already yeah. have the pump flip right that's yeah okay there you go yeah so what's been your worst mistake on your lean journey? There was one big one. Being an ass. <laughs> being an asshole what does that look like? being an asshole to my people in the very beginning the first year uh, an example of that hair on fire I talked about that my hair on fire hey you gotta do this why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing this not realizing you need to develop people not feeling it was a slow methodical process of development and training people and you didn't tell us that at the end of the yeah, year yeah, the don't, trip. Go, don't like, go back with your hair on fire I went back with my hair on fire and boy did I yeah, I, I burned the house down, baby. I burned the house down. Okay. Okay. Explain why lean only work uh, if you do it in order to help people. Sometimes many yes. companies are following yeah. indicators yeah. or money or you know market share. But how do we need to think about uh, focusing to serve this? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you an answer that's going to shock you a little bit. So first of all, you need to understand how the universe has been ordered and organized. And if you understand that, uh, you can get past all this stuff very quickly. I think that God clearly understood that the greatest thing another human being could do for another person is to lay down their life. Give your life in the service to another person. That, that was really the cycle and that's really what that was the Christ cycle Christ laid down his life for other people and I think that that is really the way the world works and humanity works at its finest when that is occurring and so if you make lean about how to be more efficient or how to make more money, you're really not in harmony with the way the universe has been established. Things should go. And as soon as you get in line with that, where you're actually laying down your life, you're actually giving to other people without expecting anything in return, but just because you know it's the right thing to do, because you know it's the way the universe has been ordered, uh, things fall into place very, very quickly and you're not uh, kicking against the goat all the time. You're not you're not struggling so much. That That's the answer. It's not the answer you're probably thinking I was gonna no. give but that's the honest answer that's why it's important to serve other people have you done that on fast step and what are the results well I've done it the best I can at fast I'm a human being believe me yeah the results are two second lean is all over the world in 20 some languages and spreading like wildfire and I can't answer my phone fast enough and, and the other beautiful thing and the most important thing is leaders like you guys are right raising up and taking the, the mantle and moving that's forward right. all over the world and it's a beautiful thing it's not about me it's about all of us that's learning right. to serve one another and help one another and that's the beautiful thing about it it has nothing to do with me it has to do with that's doing right. life 
mind the right way. That's exactly why we're doing this interview now, so you can help the people who are watching. Sure. Not yeah. just and I'm happy and I'm happy to do it. You come to my factory a few months ago, mm -hmm. and uh, first-hand witnessed you obsess over the smallest detail, which everyone else kind of overlooks when they come to visit. Right. Obsessed, like to the max. One, two hours at one station. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, what, what naturally makes you do that? Why should we do that? What makes it struggle? The word is struggle because it just looked like there was a d degree of struggle. It looked like if I was put into that work environment, that I would have started to struggle. So I said, "Why are we struggling?" That's why. Simple struggle. Stop struggling. So That's why. You put yourself in the shoes. Of the I person felt doing exactly. The job, and you look at every single small detail. I'm a worker. Look at my hands. They're yeah. scarred. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I'm not executive. I may have an executive role in many regards, but I really feel what it's like to have to manipulate things okay. and make things and put things in order in terms of building things, right? I think of everything through that prism. Would I want to do that job? We are very impressed, Paul, of the development of Lucas, which is your right hand guy yeah. at FastCap. So what would you say is the key to developing leaders like Lucas? Hardcore. Uh, I can't even tell you if Lucas was here right now, he would concur with me. I can't even tell you the number of times Lucas, come in the conference room. Okay, what's going on? Lucas, this is the way leaders work. I mean, you can't sit out there and say, well, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, okay, you need to buck up. You need to get out there and you need to be in their face, direct, fair, as Mr. Yabe says, warm hearted, strict and fair. And Lucas, you, you have to be warm hearted, but you have to be strict and you have to be fair and you have to be consistent in doing that yeah. all the time. Wow. That, that, and that's how I developed him. And just constantly nonstop in the conference room. That's role play. What's it sound like? L Lucas, I, I don't know how to do that. Okay, let's role play. Mary, listen, I noticed that you were a little short with that person the other day. And you know, that that's not the fast cap way. The way we do is we treat people with respect and we want to listen. We want to find out what the problem was and we want to work together as a team. You didn't do that. Okay, Lucas, now you do it. And I make him say it. I make him feel what it's like to articulate those words effectively. And that's what I did. I can't even tell you the countless numbers of times I did that with him. So what was his personality traits that you see in the early days that made you think, right, this guy? Oh, I remember it like yesterday. The number one thing was passion. He walked into my conference room. I'll never forget when he walked in the front door and he said, hey, my name is Lucas. You know, I want to apply for a job here and I said you know he had some energy and so I brought him right into the conference room and he was kind of nervous you know how Lucas can get a little nervous he, he's kind of like you know like this and I oh, this guy's got some energy man <laughs> we, we could take that and convert it into some lean stuff we, we, we got something here right and so he was passionate and he was excited he wasn't like yeah hey, I'm Lucas I want to apply for a job at Fanscape I heard it's a good place to work was like, huh, I heard it was a place to work I go you're hired <laughs> You couldn't say no. It was a good decision, wasn't it? Yeah, damn right. Yeah, damn right. It was a good decision. Has that approach ever gone the other way? Yeah. Well, mm, I'm sure it has. Yeah. I, I, it's not 100%. Uh, yeah, I think I've had one or two. I can't think of them off the top of my head that were really, really on fire that I hired that turned out to be total duds. But I think it's very rare. Okay. I think I think it's a good it's a good signal. But more the contempt for humanity or the love of humanity is the greatest signal. Yeah. Okay. At this point in your life, I mean, you've got into uh, the Mount Everest, you've done 50 tours, we're the 50th tour yeah, in Japan, yeah, 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 yeah. which is the official ones, you probably have another 50 we've done more. Yeah, we've done more than that, but the, but the official 50, yeah. You're kite surfing, you're doing all these things, What what is the next thing that Paul wants to accomplish? Well, something that I think about a lot is succession. How do we keep this going, I'm such a, I'm such a, a nobody, you know, like a DNC student and, and just not, didn't go to MIT, didn't have a, a MBA, just have a degree, just a carpenter. And, you know, I've been afforded this incredible opportunity to be with Mr. Amazawa, Vice President of Lexus and all these great people. So I, wa I want that to continue on. And so I think about succession. I think about you taking my place and you guys taking my place and you, which you guys are doing a great job of already. So I think about how do we make sure we rise up, raise up leaders across the board, whether it be my son, Lucas, you, uh, Ryan Tierney, Michael Altop, whoever it is, that everybody works together and, and, and continues to do great things for the world. That's all. That's my number one goal. Two second lean, first lean book. Have you done a second one? Are you working on the second one? 
Second one, I'm, one, I'm six, seven. We're on the sixth, sixth book. Impact was just published. That would be the yep. sixth one. So it was two second lean, and then it was lean health. Then it was lean travel. Then it was lean life. Then it was banish sloppiness. Then it was impact two second lean, yep. which you were in, and a lot of people were in, of all the great things. And now I'm working on the, the latest book, which is the book about what happened at the summit. So yeah, seventh book. That's what I was kind of referring to. And what's, what's going to be the name of that one? Do you know yet? You know, I've, I've got many names. Uh, I don't know yet for sure. Uh, but the essence of the book is try to address the pitfalls that people have made and alleviate those so you can get more quickly to build that culture and some of the things mistakes that people have made and some of the things that I think are critical that I see. I think Alex addressed uh, one, probably the most important one, is you know people don't start in the bathroom, and and it's the most basic thing. And if you can't get your head around just getting the bathroom dialed in and making it spectacular, then uh, you're, you're going to miss the whole thing. So that's one of the things. But there are many other things too I talked about in the book. So Paul, what makes you happy? What makes you angry? Oh gosh. What makes me happy is when I'm improving. When I wake up and I play the guitar and I can play a little bit better, I can sing a little bit better. When I lead a keynote presentation on the bus and it goes a little more smoothly, when I can look at you guys in the eyes because I'm sitting in a chair and not twisting around. Anything to do with improvement in my life, whether it be how I brush my teeth or that I'm flossing my teeth more, more efficiently and effectively. Anything to do with improvement makes me happy. Anything to deal with an asshole makes me pissed, okay? So the minute I come in and engage an asshole, uh, then I'm just like, I become furious. But of course, uh, I don't let those people into my life very often. And as soon as they do come into my life, I either run or tell them off and then run. Yeah, we're testimony, you have zero tolerance for that. <laughs> zero, zero tolerance for that, yeah. Well, how do you really teach to learn to see waste. You talked about a little bit of people struggling, but if I have someone, a, a new Lucas, and I remember Lucas saying, I do the questions that no one else is making, that's his main job. How do you train to see that waste? Because for you, it's evident you've done it, you have it a natural way of, of looking at it, but what recommendation you can give to people that are trying to learn to see waste? The number one thing you do to get people to see waste is you must be a Tasmanian devil at eliminating it yourself. So if you are eliminating waste at every turn and you're just like a waste eliminator like crazy, then people go, oh my gosh, I get what he's saying. So you can teach it. But if you show it, you're much better. And I'll give you the best example of that is I think it was Tom Hughes came on the Japan study mission. I, I think it was Tom. And he was shocked at how much I was improving on the Japan study mission. I wasn't talking about improvement. Every time he turned around, I was changing this, changing this, changing this. And you saw it a little bit here he on this trip, right? He told me the story. Yeah. yeah. That is a true statement. Yeah. So I think that you need to not just eliminate ways, you need to be a Tasmanian devil about so it's eliminating it, it's teaching by example by extreme example extreme example. extreme example that's the easiest way for me yeah and the ability to pivot as we see on this trip mm -hmm. we oh yeah to one, talk about it went to the toyota techno museum. museum it was closed it was closed there was guys working on the paving yeah lot. Pavy the road so me and Alex was at the front of the bus and we see all this happen and we looked at each other like, what the <laughs> oh, hell was going this on? This is a problem. And uh, I think people at the back didn't even realize what was going on and you, just smoothly we continued on. Just how continue how on. did that happen? Well, the first thing was, that's a very good, good question actually. The only thing I cared about at that moment was the customer. I wasn't thinking about my reputation. I wasn't thinking about my inconvenience. I wasn't thinking about my anger. Like, how come we don't know that? I wasn't thinking, mommy, how come you didn't double check this? I wasn't thinking, check no museum. What the hell are you doing closing in the middle of the day? You know, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I only had one thought. How do I make sure my customer experience is still amazing? So that was my number one focus. And I knew that if I was disruptive or murrah, 
If I showed a bunch of unevenness, that that would be disconcerting to everyone. So I just let Mr. Amazawa continue. Mommy immediately got on the phone, started figuring out where we were going to go and how we were going to manage the details, and it went off smooth. Customer first. Paul, in this trip, I have a big revelation that you taught me, and this was, I, I always thought that... Hopefully I showed it to you. You but showed maybe it I, to Maybe you. I taught it to you, but yeah, that hopefully I showed, you showed it to me. It to me, not only in the trip, but every, almost every day. I thought that Japan was about quality, mm -hmm. but then you made me reflect deeply because you said it is not about quality, it's about training. That's right. Because by training, you understand that you need to come into a routine which makes you improve, which mm -hmm. makes you go ahead and do quality and best customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Why is not about quality? Because it is, but it's not. So well, let's tell the story. The story is simple. You know, seven, eight years ago, I was here with Norman Bodak. Uh, Jack, you weren't on that trip, right? And Norman invited me to come. It was my third or fourth trip to Japan at that point. And Norman had 30 of our leaders in a room like this, and he asked, what is Japan all about? And not one of us could answer the question, including me. And at the end, Norman said, it's about quality. You think about Sony, you think about Kawasaki, you think about Honda, Toyota, Lexus, uh, the best brands in the world, Kubota, Mitsubishi, you just go right on the line, the best, it's about quality. Japan is about brand quality. So, that made perfect sense to me. And then the more and more I came back, I realized that the way they were delivering quality was through training. But then you articulated on this trip that really a level above training is kata or routine. So what the Japanese are doing is they have this beautiful routine that allows them to deliver consistent quality. Some of the routines are all on all the construction sites and manufacturing plants, there is a patrol. There's a patrol at nine o'clock. There's a patrol at 11 o'clock. There's a patrol at two o'clock. There's a patrol at five o'clock. So all leaders are on patrol. We go to the biggest high rise in, in Japan, in Tokyo, and the head of this entire billion dollar project is on patrol on the outside of the building, making sure there's zero impact on the community and his work environment. So patrol is kata, patrol is routine. Every day the children, their routine is to clean the school. Every day their routine, their kata, is to serve one another. Every day their routine is to clean the school and clean up after themselves. So ultimately, while the training is extremely important, they develop katas that support quality. Is that, is that, that reasonable? Does. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Okay, and this was something you articulated, so now I get to learn even more. Really, it's about their beautiful katas. Because I, I, I really now understand why it's so important to have our morning meeting, our improvement mm -hmm. time. Absolutely. So what would you tell those, those let's say, uh, people that want to change their company and they hesitate to even give some time for improvement time? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Believe it or not, don't, don't do it. it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You just keep doing what you're doing and keep enjoying the failures and, and being flummoxed and everything else that you feel on a daily basis. Just keep doing it because if, if you don't want order, if you don't want quality, if you don't want dependability and predictability, then don't do it. <laughs> there's, there's a beautiful phrase that we took from you, from you and we put it in our restroom in our shop. And it's respect for people is respect for the product. Yeah. And respect for the product goes respect to the customer. Mm -hmm. And that respect only is, is done by katas. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So Good solid routines. Solid Good routines. solid routines that support what you what you want your outcome to be. Paul, is there a question that we have not asked you that you'd love to us to give you? What are we missing? What question have we not done? Well, whether it's a question or a statement, yes. we'll determine that as it comes out of my mouth. I want everyone to be happy. And I've determined with, unequivocally that what makes humanity happy is when they feel like they are improving, their lot in life is improving, their family's improving, their economics are improving, their health are improving. And 
If you want to be happy, you need to get on the improvement journey as fast as you can because I've met a lot of people all over the world and been to 122 countries and I have never, ever, ever met a human being that the minute something improves in their life, that a smile doesn't come over their face. Beautiful. Hey, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much. My pleasure. Hey guys, if you have any questions about the two-second lean, feel free to comment down below your question. Thanks for watching.